Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to start with a quick survey. Please raise a hand if you have traveled with train before. That was an easy one, everyone. OK, to narrow it down, how many of you have traveled with train in the last year in Norway and bought the ticket through the NSP website? Oh, it's still some. Uh, I have some good news for you. You have used an Elm application to buy that ticket. What? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I didn't ex expect uh, applause, but great. <laughs> uh, anyway, my name is Jonas Bertel. Uh, I work in Norwegian consulting firm Beck, and for the last year, I have written Elm at NSB. In this presentation, I will talk about our experience with Elm at the project. So, NSB is the Norwegian State Railway, one of Norway's largest providers of public transportation. In 2017, a total of 178 million uh, trips were made with NSP. And the same year, NSP had a total revenue of about 14 billion Norwegian kroners. So NSP is a large company, and especially in a Norwegian scale. Our journey with Alm at NSP started about two years ago. And a little disclaimer, this was before my time, but I have some uh, credible sources like Eric, who's told me what happened. <laughs> And at the time, Elm was relatively new, and at least for our team, unproven technology. However, we had some passionate team members that really liked the basic ideas behind Elm. So these team members decided to build something useful to get experience with Elm, and to test whether Elm actually was a viable option to other more established technologies. In their own free time, they started to build a system for monitoring the microservices at NSP. And you see a screenshot from the app pair, and it's in use today. But what's important is that the experience with building this app was great. And uh, the team really saw that it was both a viable option for building, th building things, but also that it added value over other technologies. So with this experience, the team gained the confidence to try out Elm at a real NSB project. <sighs> at that time, we needed to build an administration tool for internal use. And this fit very well with selling the use of Elm to stakeholders, as the app was small and not business critical. Uh, and again, here is a screenshot from the app. Uh, here we see the ticket of one of our uh, developers and his interactions with it. I guess you can't really read anything, but uh, just for in this GDPR times, this information is just saved for a short while and then deleted, but it's used for debugging. Uh, and again, the experience with, with building this app was good. And it show, uh, importantly, it showed the stakeholders at NSP that Elm was a good option. So it was decided to try out Elm uh, in a consumer-facing application. Uh, at, this, at the time, NSP had a simple seat picker uh, that had been implemented three times. Once in the Android native app, once on the iOS native app, and once on the web. And it was decided to do an experiment and replace all these implementations with a web application, uh, Elm application that would run as a web view on all platforms. And what really made this experiment great was that the task was given to two fresh, inexperienced summer interns. And the idea being that if this guy can make an Elm app in one summer, anyone could do it. <laughs> and I know it's a bit braggy to say, but it was a big success. Uh, and the app has run on all platforms for one and a half years with no runtime errors and almost no bugs, almost. Uh, it is also the only Elm we have that uh, is used in mobile applications. So yeah, here you see the, uh, the app on all platforms. And in the middle, it's embedded in the old uh, ticket purchase flow on the website. So after this series of successful Elm experiments, it was decided to use Elm as the main web language moving forward. The Elm train was rolling. Choo-choo! <laughs> <laughs> At the time, there were several factors warranting a big rework of the uh, NSB website. The design was dated, the technology was aging in a bad way, and other big changes was coming up. So this led to the decision uh, of gradually replacing all the application with new, fresh, updated Elm applications. And now things got real, because now we were moving all the business-critical apps to Elm. At uh, this point, we met a new challenge, because up till now, only develop developers with a particular interest in Elm 
and two very talented summer interns had worked with Elm. But now developers with no prior experience with Elm or even functional programming was added to the team. And luckily we have found that getting productive with Elm really takes a much shorter time than we anticipated in the beginning. And to facilitate quick on, uh, a quick onboarding, we have uh, generally followed some very you know, common sense routines. So normally people start out playing around with Elm, doing some tutorials for a couple of days. And as they get comfortable with Elm, they, um, we let them start working on a small part of a single application. And here we try to find a part that fits their competency. So if it's a guy that knows a lot of front end, everything about HTML, CSS, it's natural to have them start working with views. Or if you have a guy like me when I started that knew no front end at all, maybe it's better to do something else like back end integrations or um, business logic. And as the new guys, new developers get more comfortable, they can branch out, expand what they do. And we have found that this approach really leads to early productivity and shorter learning times. Additionally, the entire team is always sitting close together. So if you have a question or want to do some pair pro programming, it's always available. So in the last year, a lot has happened. Uh, almost 20 people from four different teams have coded Elm uh, to some degree. Uh, we now have 14 different Elm applications running on our sites. And we have almost finished converting the entire ticket purchase flow to Elm. Uh, in total, we have about 60,000 lines of code in uh, of Elm code in production. So here you see a demonstration of the ticket purchase flow. And I'm not sure if you can see it, but the text here is in English. And of course, we serve Norwegian as well. And for internationalization, we use a package called Elm Internationalization, which was presented at the previous Oslo Elm um, Day conference. Uh, so if you haven't heard about this package or seen the talk, there's a YouTube video. And what this packet does, it, package does is that it uh, allows you to write text outside of the source code. And then at build time, you can link the language files into the source code. And what's great with that is that it removes the complexity of language from your code and to the build process. So the views you see here are written using two extensions to the core Elm HTML library. It's accessible HTML and Elm CSS. And we strongly recommend these two libraries. So accessible HTML is written by Tessa, who spoke before lunch. And it uses the Elm type system to enforce semantic good HTML. And it also has a lot of helper function for, uh, for accessibility. Uh, Elm CSS is written by Richard, who had the first talk today. And as the name suggests, it's all about writing CSS in Elm. And I know there are many good arguments both for and against uh, inline CSS. But in our opinion, putting the CSS in Elm has some really nice additional perks to the, you know, the normal things. So one thing is the type safety you get. It's really nice to write type safe CSS. And I can say this uh, for myself when I started, and I knew no CSS at all. Having the compiler help you with the CSS helped a lot. Uh, the other thing is the Elm architecture, which encourages a clear separation between view, update, and model code. And when you then move this style in with a view code, it doesn't really mess up the, the rest of the code base. So it's pretty neat. Yeah. Uh, through the video in the background here, you saw five different Elm applications. And there's a lot of shared design, naturally, between these applications, shared elements. And to reuse these elements, we have created a component library. <coughs> so here you see the documentation page for the uh, component library. And we use this library as the home of our uh, basic atomic styles. So this is really useful when we do inline CSS, as we don't want to have you know, CSS values all over the code. Now we have one place where we get it and uh, you know, can change if we need to refactor. Just dry. Yeah, so the page you see is uh, created automatically by putting together code examples and automatically parsed out comments 
styled with Markdown, and function signatures. And the code for this we kind of stole from a guy called, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, but <laughs> a guy that spoke at uh, Oslo Meetup, L Meetup last year. Uh, and having this generated documentation page is really nice. Uh, for the developers, we can go in here, check function signatures, see the use cases for the different uh, components, but also for the designers as a toolbox uh, when they build new designs. Uh, and this library has kind of grown organically. We didn't sit down and just plan what we wanted here. As soon as we create new components and reuse them, we kind of realize we're going to have this all over the place. So let's just extract them to the library. Uh, creating the component library has taken some work, naturally. And you can see the, you probably don't see it this here, but there are hundreds of versions, and many of them are uh, breaking ones. So in the beginning, we spent, I hate to say it, we spent way more time building this, uh, this library than we got out of it. But in the recent half year, it has really stabilized. And now it, uh, the tables have turned like this is a big productivity boost for us. So yeah, this works fine. Or great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's also good with it is that it uh, helps us have you know the same design all over. It ensures a unified look across the pages, and it also helps other teams uh, use Elm or motivate other teams to use Elm when they have this awesome library. It's really easy to just try try it out, build something new in it. So here's a screenshot from one of our our apps, and as you can see, almost everything is just taken directly from the library. It really speeds up the uh, time to build this. Uh, we also have other private libraries. Uh, and uh, these are for things like logging, Google Analytics, business logic. And as they are specific to what we do at NSP, we don't really want to publish them. The problem with this is that Elm has no support for private libraries. And in Elm 0.18, this wasn't really a problem. There was this nice package called Elm GitHub install that let you add private packages. But uh, to Elm 0.19, uh, this package broke, and there's no replacement. So instead, we have been using JIT subtree, where we clone down the libraries into the application repositories. And of course, the downside with this is that uh, now you either have to manually clone down the libraries all the time, or you have to check it in with the source control. Unless you build a script that automates this or use uh, Elm JIT install, which is a package that Robin made. I guess some of you guys just saw him. He's one of my colleagues. And yeah, this makes uh, private packages work smoothly. Of course, having native support would be better, but yeah, it works. So to be honest, there aren't really many clouds on the Elm sky. Uh, the few pains we have encountered are minor and normally easy to work around. But one thing we have struggled with is animations of elements with dynamic height. <laughs> I, I mean, this is something that's never easy anywhere. Uh, and in the JavaScript world, you kind of use some hacks to make it happen. But the problem is that uh, doing the same hacks uh, with Elm makes it even harder to do. So, yeah, for us, this is like, normally we just try to avoid it, do other animations or even no animations at all. And this is a good example of when things are easy to do or uh, when Elm has uh, native out-of-the-box support for something or nice libraries for something, the experience is awesome. But if there is no good Elm way to do it, it's actually often a bit harder than it would be otherwise if you wrote a JavaScript application. Another thing that's been a bit painful, I mean, there are many small things. And an example of this is getting the page URL when your application runs as an element on the web page. So in 0.18, you had the navigation library that let you do this. But in uh, 0.19, there is no way to just get the URL. You have to pass it in through a port or uh, the flags. And of course, this is too much work, but then you have to decode this URL, and then you have to handle all the impossible states that this can lead to. Because you know, what if you don't have an URL? It shouldn't really happen, but 
Ja. Uh, and then I've been talking a bit about problems going to 0 0.19. Uh, it was actually a bit of a rocky experience for us. Uh, so I am an eternal optimist. I was like, yeah, it's going to be a couple of days, no problem. And we spent some weeks doing this upgrade. Uh, in addition, we had some, uh, some um, dependencies that took months to upgrade, so we were stuck in 0 0.18 for a while. However, going to 0 0.19 has been great, and there has been API changes, of course, that w most of them are really good, but the big thing are the compiler improvements. And uh, here we have looked at the average size of our applications, gzipped, earlified, and gzipped, and it has decreased by about 75% from 18 to 19. So that really improves uh, payloads, page load times, user experience. So that's great, but what's more important, for me at least, are the improvements to the compile time. So, uh, the uh, yeah, it's gone from, on average, around five seconds to one and a half, and the development workflow of doing changes and then waiting for your compiler to take you to places where you need to follow up on the changes really improves when you have to wait one second instead of five. So imagine doing a change and then waiting five seconds, a hundred times a day, or hundreds of times, it really adds up. Uh, so this is great. What's also good uh, is uh, the call compile time improvements, which has gone from around 50 seconds on average to 11. And especially because we use Travis, uh, which is kind of, it's even slower than doing it on your computer. So now we only have to wait one minute instead of five uh, for the Travis build to finish. All of these great improvements. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, to summarize, I have three key points I want to emphasize. So first, if you want to introduce Elm at your workplace, start small, do small experiments. Elm is awesome, but to get an even better experience, use some of the really good libraries. And from our experience, we can recommend uh, Elm CSS, accessible HTML, uh, I've heard many good things about Elm UI, uh, so make sure to use these libraries. And finally, Elm is awesome. Thank you very much.